very much again for joining us for the second to last University of Washington Data Science Seminar this quarter. Um, the University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, um, Chase Dowling. Um, Chase is an applied scientist at Pacific Nas uh, Northwest National Laboratory. He received his PhD in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Washington. Uh, Chase's research, uh, research projects have focused on statistical and machine learning of large engineered systems like roadways and power grids. He is a former graduate fellow of the Clean Energy Institute, and he's currently a member of the Pacific Science Center where he developed engineering mathematics exhibits for students K-12. Um, today, Chase is going to talk about an interesting topic, which is fusing confusing data streams insight into Seattle's transportation system. As usual, please use the Q&A button to ask your questions, preferably at the end of the talk. Uh, Chase will address the questions at the end of his presentation. Um, if you're ready, Chase, I would like to invite you to begin your presentation. Yeah, just make sure you can hear me. Am I muted? We can hear you. Good? Okay, great. Nice. All right. Well, first, thank you everyone for joining me for this talk at uh, four thirty in the afternoon, towards the end of the week, and what I presume was a long day of web calls for everyone. So I do hope to make this a little bit entertaining for people. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to talk about some of our project work today. Um, as Nicoletta mentioned, our talk today is about fusing confusing data streams. Uh, gaining some insight into Seattle's transportation system. Um, and this is a project funded by the Department of Energy's Vehicle Technologies Office. And it's a small piece of a very broad um, smart mobility consortium of national laboratories all over the country. And so while we'll look at Seattle today, because that's what many of us know and love, um, this work covers many cities. Um, so I'm happy to talk about the consortium larger offline if anybody's interested. Um, so yeah. Um, today, we want to try and answer a question. Uh, the question we want to answer is how could we use multiple data streams, they're all different, to improve core business district curbside performance? Um, and in answering this question, um, we'll just cover a few things. We're going to talk about why we're going to talk about curb space. You know, this is not something that's going to wow people at parties, but when you think about it, it it's pretty interesting. Um, we're going to talk about how we fuse these different data streams to gain some insight. Um, then we're going to kind of step back, and this is somewhere I would really um, appreciate some audience participation or suggestions from the audience, but um, we're still in the very early stages of this project. We want to talk about how we might abstract this data fusion process. Um, it was very difficult. We end up having to do a lot of bespoke things to get it done. So I would love for some feedback on that topic. And then last, we're going to talk about some ongoing project goals and how, what the implementation looks like. Um, so anyway, um, why are we doing this? Um, our mobility landscape is changing rapidly. Um, we really do need to rethink uh, land use, particularly at the curb. And we can think about it a little bit more abstractly. We can think of curbs in the city as kind of this interfacing layer, or the point of resistance in getting on or getting off our surface transportation network. And if you think about it, lots of people are competing for space other than just somebody trying to park. You know, there's the food delivery driver, there's the bus, there's the garbage truck, there's the UPS truck. They're all competing for access to the space um, as we know traditionally, but now it's even more complicated. Uh, maybe you've noticed around town that Seattle City Light has curbside EV charging, which is great. Um, not everybody has um, EV charging at home, like if they live in an apartment building and they need access to charge an electric vehicle. Um, in response to the pandemic, the city's closed a lot of streets and closed a lot of curbs so that, uh, if you recall, during the summer, restaurants were able to spill out into the outdoors onto the sidewalk and creating space for businesses on the curbside. Um, and a lot of people are taking more deliveries. And so now competition for this space is, is getting tougher, even in a smaller city like Seattle as compared to something like Chicago or New York City. And, you know, with something like partial autonomy on the horizon, um, where you lower the costs and overheads of doing business and delivering things, this competition is going to be very fierce. 
And we want to ensure people are able to, you know, get around still with all of this competition. But we can think about this even more abstractly. And why would the Department of Energy care about, you know, people competing for parking on the curb? Um, and we can take an extreme and contextual example to look at how something as mundane as like your curb policy impacts um, everything on the transportation network. And so in the pictures below, on the left-hand side, we have a picture of I-5 over Portage Bay and Lake Union. And the curb control policy, if we look here, is no parking on the shoulders. It's emergency stops only. And taking the speed limit aside, the flow, the capacity, the flux of this roadway is very high. It moves lots of vehicles very efficiently, but you're not intended to stop there. And on the right-hand side, we have like the extreme opposite. It's still four lanes wide, one way, and despite a slower speed limit, the curb policy is, you know, pick up, drop off, five minutes. Everybody's weaving in and out of each, each other's way to get access to the curb because the point of this roadway is to get people on and off the transportation network. And so something like the curb policy has a massive impact on the roadway's efficiency in moving vehicles. And we care about this because as we continue to see electric vehicle penetration, we can think of vehicles moving on the roadway as a form of power flow and that the grid needs to demand, uh, meet the demands of that power flow. And so all of these exogenous factors up to and including the curb policy is gonna impact the energy efficiency as, uh, of our transportation network. So this is why we're gonna look at this. Um, so what do we wanna look at? How do we do curb management policy? Well, there's lots of new data streams that we can take advantage of to learn something about the curb. Um, and what we can do is we can take all of these different data streams and hopefully paint a complete picture of what's happening at the curb. Uh, maybe some of you have seen some of these data sources, but they're all very focused on specific modalities or modes of transportation. And some of these include transactions for paid parking, which is available from the city. Um, there are companies like Automatus that look at traffic camera data and do computer vision on vehicles accessing the curb. There's also old school loop detectors and magnetometers still on the roads now. It's how the, um, the streetlights work. They detect vehicles going by. Um, the UW's Urban Freight Lab, one of our collaborators, listed on the title side, they're using manual observation and study. And actually, this is where we're going to get a lot of the data for our example case study. But they have students get out on the street and manually annotate what's happening on the curb. What are they doing? Who's parking? How long? Are they double parked? Did they park in front of a fire hydrant? Are they blocking traffic? Um, and last, uh, OEM vehicle GPS signals and things like uh, what's called telematics, what freight companies use to send information back to some sort of operational base that describes where the vehicles are going. But suppose we could have this complete picture, like suppose we could take all these data sources and mash them together and have a complete picture of the chaos that's occurring at the curb. Um, how would we best use this information? What what are we gonna do with it to inform how our transportation network's being used? Um, and what we propose is using something called bid rent theory. Uh, on the left-hand side is kind of the Wikipedia graphic on the bid rent theory, and it does a great job of summarizing what this is. But bid rent theory describes in real estate terms, the value of land as a function of the distance from the center of a city or the core business district by zone types. So if we look at the graph um, here, we got retail, manufacturing, and residential. Retail is the most valuable, very close to the city. Manufacturing is more valuable, a little bit further from the city, but close enough to make deliveries to ports and things like that. And residential is the most valuable in the outskirts of the city, like the suburbs. And not that it's more valuable than retail, it's a function of the distance from the destination that imparts some value. It's a function of space. We can also think about this for in terms of you know, the real estate of the curb. In the graphic on the right, we see this same pattern. This is some work done by uh, a, a colleague of mine when I was in grad, to, uh, grad school in the EC department, uh, Tanner Fies, who was looking at using Gaussian mixture models to learn kind of these shapes that describe patterns of demand in um, curb parking. And we can think about how in the sense of curb parking, there might be multiple places I may want to go, but the closer I am to where I wanna go, say like the market, which is down in the bottom right, the closer I am to the market, the more valuable it is for me to park. I might be willing to search for a space rather than park far away and walk. But this kind of applies to all businesses. 
if I'm a delivery driver, I want to stop close to my uh, point of destination. So I don't have to spend a lot of time carting boxes back and forth. So we want to apply, we want to use this method to take all of these data sources and describe maybe some new way to use our curb space. Um, and that's what kind of what we do. We start with what does this kind of surface of demand or these curves that we saw here, you can think of these as curves that describe different modalities. For one modality, we might see a hypothetical surface over the core downtown of Seattle, where there are you know, these locations that have the highest demand for that modality. This might be, for example, uh, medical deliveries or um, special courier services or even just parking. But it describes a single modality and some sort of cost that they're willing to pay, some sort of cost that they incur, or alternatively, some sort of utility that's gained by the transportation network. And we want to optimize over this surface. So we want to use the data to describe this demand surface. Um, if we have this description of demand for curb real estate, um, we can select an optimal zoning or space allocation in the form of an optimization problem. I can optimize over this surface for multiple transportation modalities. And we can see how they might look different by modality in this graphic at the bottom. On the left-hand side, we have buses and they might value the ends of a block face the most because they may impede traffic the least in these locations. Whereas for parking, they may have different demands for different parts of a block face. And lastly, maybe for commercial delivery, they might greatly favor being able to park in front of the doorways of their delivery destinations. So we have these, <clears throat> these, these demands that we can measure as a function of the modality, but we need to pass them some sort of performance objective function over which to optimize. This might be the emissions that they generate, the productivity or the throughput of vehicles, or in terms of access, we want people to be able to move around the city kind of independent of the modality. People should be able to take the bus, people should be able to ride their bikes, people should be able to access key parts of the city if their only choice is by car. Um, but we also want to constrain these decisions. And this is where we kind of combine this data science process of mashing all these data sources together with some sort of domain expertise. How do we constrain this optimization problem so that we have an optimal distance between zone types. Uh, you might know that in Seattle, the target distance between bus stops is a quarter mile along a particular route. If you were maximizing, say, productivity naively, you might say, make every spot along the curb a bus stop because buses move the most people. But that's not practical in reality. We have to reflect that in a policy constraint. <clears throat> So how do we do this estimation? How did we mash these data sources together to create a holistic picture of what the demand for curbside looks like? Um, in the case of a small study zone in Seattle, um, we combine four different curb data sources in addition to some global parameters that we cite from numerous EPA studies, highway transportation, uh, um, Department of Transportation studies on things like fuel efficiency, value of time, and things like that. Um, these four data sources are digital paid curb transactions. So when you go to park downtown, you go to the parking meter, you pay for parking, you say when you're going to park and when you leave. Um, the second data source comes from a study performed by UW's Urban Freight Lab. Um, and they looked at different parts of the city. This graphic on the left, left or on the right, excuse me, is one of the parts of the city that they looked at. This is near the Insignia Towers apartments between 5th and 6th Avenue. So it's it's kind of close. This up here is um, Denny Avenue and the you know, Space Needle is going to be like over here somewhere. <clears throat> so pretty close to Belltown. Um, they, what they did is they had several students camped out throughout this area and they measured or they recorded different commercial vehicle loading and unloading activities, um, delivery trucks, food trucks, things like that. Um, the third data source that we combine is um, bus alighting studies that King County Metro takes care of, it, and it measures how many people are getting on and off a bus stop. In this particular study area, um, we looked at five study areas which are identical to the study areas that were uh, looked at in um, the 2019 paper from the Urban Freight Lab. In this particular study, um, the single bus stop is right here on, excuse me, uh, I think it's Bell, yes, Bell Street. Um, and then the last data source that we look at is uh, 
manual observation of transportation network company activities. And this is another study from the UW Urban Freight Lab. Um, they were very, uh, one of our collaborators on the project. They've been very kind to share this data with us from these studies. When I go to share these slides, um, we'll, uh, the links here to the papers will be available and you can check out the description of these data sources. But essentially they describe the times at which the vehicles are arriving and departing <clears throat> in different parts of this downtown area. And what we wanna do is take these different data sources, they all have different denominators. They all measure different things. I have digital transactions that tell me, oh, I'm a person that parked on this block face from like 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. And then from the manual studies, we have people saying a vehicle arrived at 2 p.m., left at 2.15, performing this activity. And then even further, we have the bus data, which is like an average of the number of arrivals and departures at fixed points in time. Say uh, the bus arrival scheduled for 2.05 p.m., 10 passengers got off, two passengers got on. And we wanna find what's the least common denominator that gives us some information about the occupancy of what's happening at the curb, who is competing for space at the curb at a given time of day. And the rates that were, the, the value that we compute is arrivals per minute. And we're gonna use this as like our proxy for demand for space along the curb. With this information, arrivals per minute, we can now look at some sort of optimization problem that we put into as a function of performance metrics that are designed by another one of our collaborators, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And we can break down these performance metrics. Here we can optimize with respect to things like access and equity by looking at each individual modality and ensuring people can access um, the curb uh, in the form of costs paid by users. We can't expect someone to pay a million dollars to park and we can't expect someone to not be able to access the curb by a bus. Um, another metric that we can look at is the revenue generated by the curb. If I'm the city, I might care about implementing some sort of activation barrier so that people don't automatically just drive because it's free. Prices serve as some sort of resistance to creating congestion downtown and trying to park. Um, we can look at the productivity of the curb, and this is particularly applicable to like commercial vehicle loading. <clears throat> and the number of packages I move per trip and the amount of time that I spend blocking the curb or potentially double parked and blocking traffic. And lastly, you can look at the energy efficiency of the curb and have a preference for um, vehicle charging in a specific example, or as we mentioned abstractly, have a preference for zoning that does not impede the flow of traffic on the roadway. And we can constrain this, the policy, the domain expertise portion, we can constrain this by specifying a number of certain zoning types. We might want a minimum number of bus stops or a maximum number of parking spaces. We may want space between these zoning types. So for example, in Seattle, we have a quarter mile between most bus stops, that's the target distance. Um, and we can also constrain the number of zone changes over time. But in this study, we just looked at a particular fixed point in time over the course of the day, what might be the optimal location according to the demand signals that we're receiving from all of these competing data sources. And so we do this optimization problem without policy constraints. And for the transportation experts in the room, please, please lend me your widest, most forgiving latitude as we look at what happens when we do unconstrained optimization of the costs paid by user. On the left-hand side, we have the current curb zone allocation for this portion of Belltown. Uh, green is paid parking, orange is the little um, commercial load and load zones. Um, let me label it here. Here we have, this is a bunch of paid parking, the green spaces, the red spaces are no parking. These little orange stretches are individual spaces of commercial loading. And this blue stretch is a bus stop. And this purple, these purple spots are uh, passenger loading. If we don't constrain this problem, if we look specifically at the cost paid to users, Given the global information, the global parameters that we use to describe costs paid by modality of, with respect to target destinations within the center of each block, this is how we measure the bid rent curves. On the right hand side, we see that this optimization program um, overwhelmingly favors commercial loading because it's so productive and it minimizes costs paid per users across modalities. We're making apples to apples comparisons of different modalities without but just, just with respect to cost paid. 
but we know this is not realistic, right? We, we know there aren't that many people making deliveries and need that much space. This is kind of crazy. And this is why the policy constraints are important and incorporating this domain knowledge into this optimization program informed by all of the data. And so here we do just that. Now we implement some policy constraints. And at first glance, we don't notice much of a difference, but we do notice that if the target destinations are the centers of these blocks, many of the commercial loading zones tend towards the centers of block faces because these are closest to what are hypothetically the drop-off points along the road. Um, what we don't know, you know, we're not on the street, we don't know where the loading docks are. But we do know if we do, uh, we can say if we know where the loading docks are, that to minimize costs for commercial loading, we want to move it so that it is the least walking distance for these commercial loading zones. And we can still take objection with these constraints. And this is just, or sorry, to describe the constraints. The constraints we used here are um, a minimum and maximum number of particular parking spaces and more, uh, uh, commercial loading and one bus stop. We notice here the bus stop gets shifted over to the wrong side of the street. Uh, this is a one-way uh, one street and you can't get off of the bus on the left side. So obviously, you know, these constraints are perfect, but we see how much of a massive improvement it makes in creating a more realistic allocation. And you might be asking, well, like if you don't have the complete picture, why would I bother, <clears throat> excuse me, why would I bother to implement this change to the zoning if you know, you're not absolutely certain this is strictly better? What this does is this creates a method by which we can look at the, 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 the trade-offs in the costs, the marginal utilities of moving a space over, eliminating space and replacing it with a different modality. Here on the right, we have a graph of the costs to users in uh, the savings <clears throat> given the different constraints. So the blue line are the cost to users. Um, excuse me, the, the blue line is the savings to users um, for the current allocation with no changes. The green line is with these single constraints and the orange line is without any constraints, just a single bus stop. And while it's the least realistic constraint, it also has the largest cost difference. And what this is meant to serve to illustrate is that by reformulating all of these data streams into some sort of apples to apples comparison optimization program, we can start to look at the cost trade-offs of different allocations. And this is key. This is what we want to be able to do in the long term and for, the, uh, for, for further implementation of what we're actually gonna do down the road. Um, what we need to do next in order to push this kind of change to zoning and how to take advantage of this marginal, how do I, what happens to costs as I move spaces one way or the other, or what happens to costs as I switch them for different modalities, um, we need to get inside of a, um, a feedback loop, a demand response loop. Um, what we don't know is how do changes in zoning affect changes in demand for that zoning, right? If I suddenly eliminate all of the paid parking spaces, there may not be as much demand for paid parking spaces because users will adjust and realize that they have to take the bus in order to access the curb in this particular area or pay some very large parking garage cost. Um, and there are actually some interesting opportunities to begin to measure this feedback loop. Um, there's a case study in the city of Amsterdam where they made very large price changes to the cost to park or make reservations for commercial loading. And you can see people's response to a very large change in price. And there's also large zoning changes due to the pandemic. We can see how people respond to large changes in our transportation infrastructure when I say what was now, what, wasn't, uh, what was once parking is now a business where you can eat outside. Um, we can measure the impact of how that changes our demand and our system usage behavior. Um, and what we want to do next with this, this when we solve this optimization problem at a single time, incorporating new data sources, we want to solve this allocation problem over time. What are the optimal zoning strategies at a particular time of day or a particular time of year? And we can look at what happens when we turn this centralized optimization problem where I'm the municipality and I can say, well, okay, this is the zoning for that part of town and this is the zoning for that part of town. What happens if we make this more flexible? And we can compare the externalities incurred by a decentralized solution where I say this curb space is open to anyone provided you make a reservation and use this space via some sort of mobile app. 
And this is happening in a bunch of cities like um, uh, Boulder, Colorado, for example. Let me check my time here. Okay, cool. Um, but what have we learned in this process? Um, what we did was kind of just an exercise in uh, taking established economic and engineering theories and methods, and how can they be used as a lens to focus all these different data streams that we're getting. Um, city and municipal data streams aren't necessarily um, subject to the same incentives that private industry has when they're developing their data streams. They all look very different. There's no reason for cities to collaborate on a unified open data standard, which is something one of our collaborators is working on. Um, but how can we use these engineering models to piece these data uh, streams together to paint a more holistic picture? And what we do know is that there is a lot of this data available. So it would be silly not to take advantage of this data to adjust curve policy and make more intelligent decisions on how to use our transportation network. Um, but what was really difficult and what we observed in a lot of the shortcomings of the answers that this kind of exercise created was that the different data standards across studies created a challenge, but also different levels of data quality. So the automated passenger counts were averaged over a long period of time, but then the data that was collected by students from the urban freight lab, they had down to the minute what was happening at the curb for commercial vehicles. And converting all of these input data types into least common denominators, say arrivals per minute, required bespoke transformations for each data set. So this is one of our challenges going forward. If we're going to hope to create more realistic solutions to this allocation problem, given more information about, say, traffic, more information about actual intended destinations for, say, commercial vehicles along a block and bus routes, I care about which side of the street they're on, um, it's going to become an exponentially more complex task to write these individual transformation functions for each individual data type. So this is how we're kind of abstracting that data fusion problem. And this is where I would love to hear how anybody's, uh, for the data scientists in the room, you know, what their experience has been in cleaning data, but also combining sets of clean data. And right now we're thinking about it in two ways. Um, this here is just kind of a, a, a rough graphic of the mappings of the different types of information we need on the left to the types of information we want on the right to measure for these optimization programs, or for this optimization problem, excuse me. One way to think about it is that, you know, these arrows represent some sort of functional mapping from the input to the output. But another way to think about this problem is that inside of each of these colored bins, I can put different types of data in this arrival rate I could put in transactions. I could put in manual observations. But each of them, you know, they, they don't have equal value or worth in terms of the output that they'll end up producing in terms of their accuracy. Um, I don't necessarily have to park for as long as I've paid to park. But I do have ground truth data if somebody manually observed me enter the curb and leave the curb. So this is something that we're going to be thinking about for the next couple of years is how can we abstract this process so that we can repeat it across many cities but then how do we get away from falling into the trap of over prescribing a data fusion method without you know it being entirely unique to our current situation you know like how how does this also apply say to genomics data science or something entirely unrelated human health data science <clears throat> so i would really love some input there um, ultimately, what we want to do is take this exercise and put it into some form of implementation. And I hinted at that implementation earlier when I said, what we need to know is the marginal costs that are incurred by changing zoning or changing control policies like price, the amount of time you're able to park, such that cities don't need to A-B test different control policies in reality. I think this is kind of the key uh, pain point for municipalities is that they can't treat the city like a petri dish or a lab, uh, a, 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 a laboratory bench. They can't take a control, take an experiment and do this at scale. They might be able to do a pilot and compare the outputs, but it's a multiple year endeavor. It costs a lot of money. We need to be able to do some sort of A-B testing. And so this is what one of our collaborators, the Urban Freight Lab is working on. They're building a curb physics engine um, where we're able to do that A-B testing and look at how changes in the curb policy impact the performance of the roadway, 
the performance of the metrics that we saw in the optimization program um, so that we can see, you know, what truly is the value of moving the bus stop from one end of the block to the other, changing it from paid parking to commercial loading or uh, an Uber or Lyft stop, for example, because we'll know in simulation exactly where intended destinations are. From there, the, you know, that gives us the, um, that gives us kind of like a micro scale, a small scale that that particle physics model gives us a very small scale understanding of what's happening along a stretch of curve. We want to be able to expand this out. Like if we care about energy performance for vehicles, we need to be able to look at this across an entire city. So what we'll do with this kind of small scale simulator is extrapolate this to a citywide network. And so Lawrence Berkeley, what they've been developing in this mobility consortium is a um, city scale, a regional transportation network model called BEAM um, that uses a measure of the flux of the roadway, that kind of comparison we saw between a highway, a highway and the drop-off zone at, a, at an airport, excuse me. <clears throat> they use these pieces of information to describe how long it would take a prospective driver to transit a link. And then in sum, all of the links that they would need to transit from origin to destination, you start to get a picture of the energy efficiency of an entire network. Where are the choke points? Where are the efficient corridors? And how do people decide what route they're going to take given multiple decisions? <clears throat> and last, we want to select optimal zoning strategies. If I have this information about what's good at the micro scale, what creates good outcomes at the network wide scale, the city scale, then we can start to look at selecting optimal zoning strategies, kind of like we did with this bid rent, uh, this, uh, bid rent theory model. Um, according to curb performance metrics, that's the, again, that's what our collaborator NREL has been working on. And why we care about this fusing process is we want to be able to do it in multiple cities. And so we're gonna be looking at varied data streams. And so we're gonna to have to convert it into some sort of unified, unified um, open source data schema, which our collaborator, Lacuna, is working on. Um, here we kind of have a graphic of that architecture that I described. On the left, we have the small scale simulator and the large scale simulator. The small scale simulator tells the large scale simulator how efficient the citywide performance is. Here we learn from talking to our collaborators, you know, what's the optimal allocation method going to look like? And then we're going to create a kind of um, minimum viable product version of a communications platform that to a potential user might tell you, this is a good place to park, or this area of the city has this type of parking available at the moment for commercial drop-off or something like that. Um, last, um, where does this lead us into and things that might be of interest to the data scientists in the room? Um, some of the tasks that we will need to do in order to build that architecture in the diagram that I showed, um, we're gonna have to achieve a couple of ML-oriented tasks. We're gonna have to, predict, given what we know about the data sources that we've seen so far and dealing with the confusion they create, um, we're going to have to predict vehicle modality. Uh, given some sort of sensor measurement or video data, we're going to have to predict if this vehicle is a commercial vehicle or if this person is parking. And in many cases, it might be simple. If the data stream is paid parking transactions, we might presume that person is parking. But if the data stream, which is in the, uh, like in the case of like Melbourne in Australia, if the data stream is a bunch of sensors that are built into the curb and they just measure proximity, we would need to be able to detect whether I think that this vehicle that just parked in proximity, given the sensor signal, is somebody doing a, a truck doing a drop off versus a car parking for a long period of time. So that requires a little bit of a learning task. Um, second, we're going to have to do some sort of estimation of this demand surface by modality. And I think that this is the kind of the linchpin of the entire project is we need to reliably and in a way that can be validated, estimate the demand by modality for curb space over the entire region of the city um, and also how that demand changes in time. Um, you know, demand for paid parking goes way up during a football game versus 5 a.m. in the morning. And last, we want to do some sort of regression task on this flow of the roadways that factors in the curb zoning as an input. Um, in transportation engineering parlance, the function that describes the flow of the roadway is called a fundamental diagram. And we need lots of information like the volume of vehicles and the speed that they're traveling at. But what we would like to do is reflect how 
the curb policy impacts the flux of the roadway. And so this is going to be some sort of regression task that tells us marginal changes in curb being used for parking versus no parking versus a bus as these incremental outputs uh, or changes to the flux of the adjacent roadway. So that um, pretty much summarizes my talk. Um, I really love to hear any suggestions about people's experience in kind of this data fusion task where I have different data sets that I need to match together because I can't express how much labor, I mean, we've all seen how much labor goes into cleaning data. People joke that it's like 90% of a data scientist task, but combining multiple data sets that themselves need to be cleaned is just kind of creating uh, a lar much larger search space over a much simpler problem. Um, so yeah, with that, I'd like to take any questions. Um, and that's the end of my talk. Okay, um, I don't see any yet in the Q&A, but as a reminder, you can use the uh, Q&A um, button in the bottom towards the right-hand side of your screen to enter in your questions. I see there are some in chat. So um, uh, do you think we should cite bus stops for where um, they least impede traffic or where they provide the most utility to the people who are riding the bus? And how do can you, you factor repeat in? the can you repeat the question? Sure, sure. Um, so do you think based on what you've observed, should we cite bus stops for where they least impede uh, single occupancy tra traffic or where they provide the most utility for the people who are riding the bus? And how do you take safety uh, into a decision like that? How do you factor in things like safety? Yeah, that would be I think the simplest answer is that's that's the domain expertise reflected in policy constraints. Right, I might constrain the allocation of a bus stop to be at one end of the block face of the other, given what I already know about the performance of the bus network. Um, but safety data would be yet another data stream that you might take into consideration in this optimization program. Um, you can make it multi-objective. One thing that we do in the paper that was kind of alluded to in this, in this talk is we look at all the objectives simultaneously in kind of a linear combination. So another, um, objective function that you might look at is safety in terms of perhaps um, injuries over time, casualties over time, in terms of like accidents and things like that. That's a good, that's a good suggestion though. Okay, Nicoletta, do you see a question? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple more questions from Chess. Uh, I think I believe there are follow up questions. Um, the next yeah. one is how did you factor in the curb utilization of active transportation modes, crosswalks, bike corrals, clear zones to provide visibility to crosswalks, parking protected bike lanes, and parking for micro mobility vehicles? That's something, that, yes. So, so. Uh, in asking for the greatest latitude from the actual transportation engineers in the room. Um, that's uh, one of the data sources that we weren't able to mash together in this example study. So in this example study, we were simply, you know, treating all curb as equal, which we know is, is not the case, right? You know, um, curb space right up against a stoplight is very different than curb space at the very beginning of the roadway or right in front of a driveway entrance. We did factor in driveway entrances um, and things like fire hydrants and places where, you know, it, it, um, things like bike corrals. Um, but that sort of data is available through the city and something that we want to be able to factor in in an automated fashion through their ArcGIS files. Um, and that's something we haven't figured out how to do yet. Yeah, there are more questions from Chess. Maybe we'll go back to them. Um, but I want to read you one from the Q&A. Um, how do you decide what data is most useful to combine? Example, pick only two easiest to combine. Mm, that's a good question. Um, I mean, there are certainly many techniques that you could do in practice. Um, at this point, the data is actually relatively sparse in order for us to paint a complete picture of all modalities. So yeah, at this point, we're taking pretty much the whatever the largest data set is available on a particular modality, say in the case of paid parking, the best data set in that instance is to use curbside transactions. So we use them. Um, we're not distinguishing between each of them. Mm -hmm. One thing that like a corollary to that question might be um, 
for all of these data streams, is the, uh, the whole greater than the sum of the parts? Or is it the opposite? Do we get diminishing returns on incorporating more and more data streams? Um, and that's a good question that I don't have an answer for. I want to follow up with a, a question from Francisco. And he says, um, super cool presentation, I agree. Uh, what kinds of challenges have you had in uh, translating this research for non-specialist policymakers and decision makers, for example, to convince them of its importance? Mm. Yeah, I mean, like I joked at the beginning, you know, you don't go to a party and say like, oh, I do research on curb space that, that makes a lot of friends. Um, but if you kind of stop and think about every time you want to get on the roadway network, you have to cross the curb threshold. Every time you get on and off the bus, Every time you get in and out of a car or an Uber, every time your package gets delivered to the business that you visit downtown, it has to cross the curb. So it is the point of interface for the network. And I think that's the key way to get people to think about why it's so important. But it is a very small piece in a very uh, in a much larger picture. You know, like I mentioned at the, earlier in the talk, DOE really cares about kind of the energy efficiency of the entire system. Because if we expect many of these vehicles to be electric, we need to have some sense of where charge, where and when charging needs to occur. Um, because the amount of demand we're going to generate electrical capacity needs to be increased by orders of magnitude to be able to handle the amount of demand we might expect if you know we had 50% electric vehicles. It's, it's a crazy amount of electrical power that we would need to handle it. So DOE cares very much about um, the energy efficiency of the tire network and with that point of interface being one small component. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna read you the last question in the Q and A, maybe we can go back to the chat questions. Um, this is a, a, a question from Matt. This was a great talk as a leading question suggestion. Have you considered annotating your data sources explicitly with confidence and then using multiple input features with mixed confidence, possibly conflict is conflicting as is done in robotics. It seems like modeling your input data sets as different sensors that are good at different things could be an interesting directions to explore. Yes, yes, the answer is yes. The answer is we're gonna put variances <laughs> around any sort of empirical means and uh, do optimization over probability distributions of data, absolutely. Um, in the publication that I was talking about, it was for a policy journal. Um, so we kind of had to walk this tightrope of you know, like how much math and statistics you wanna put in rather than just lay out kind of a, a pathway that you might take advantage of in order to look at where the trade-offs are in a certain um, zoning configurations. Um, but the answer is yes, definitely want to put confidence intervals on our input data. All right, I think we're going to wrap this up with one more question. Um, have you considered using anonymized cell phone data? Um, or yeah, so um, there's there are some privacy challenges in some of the data sources that we could use. Um, Cell phone data would be particularly challenging. Um, one data set that we're kind of interested in is, you know, like if I had GPS data on OEM vehicles, for example. But again, there's a privacy concern. You know, if I, even if it's anonymized, if I have a, uh, you know, a long sequence of trajectories that these GPS signals take, I can start to infer the average origin and destination of, say, someone who's commuting to work. And that severely limits the number of people this anonymous person could be. Um, so we have to do pay very close attention to um, respecting privacy laws because it's a nationwide project. You know, if they're a little bit more lax in one state, um, we wouldn't be able to apply it in another state that has very strict privacy laws. So um, we've thought of some ways around it. You know, if I had GPS traces, I could create a radius around which I ignore um, so that the anonymized person that I could potentially gain uh, resolution on could be any of the people that reside in a very large radius. Um, but again, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a challenge dealing with the privacy concerns.
All right. Um, if there are no more questions, um, we thank Chase very much for his nice presentation today. And we'll see you next Thursday for the last edition of the QDUB Data Science Seminar this quarter. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for surviving an evening Zoom call. I really appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Chase. This was, this was really fantastic. I appreciate thank it. Thank you.